So, um, I'm going to briefly talk about um, sterilising the functional pool and what we know now in 2013. I'm going to review some of the current clinical trials aimed at cure. And I know this is a pretty knowledgeable audience, I mean, some of this might be very familiar to you, but I'm going to briefly go through strategies being tested to eliminate latency, strategies aimed at eliminating residual viral replication, enhancing HIV-specific immunity and making cells resistant to HIV. And then finally just talk briefly, and these are sort of really just random thoughts on current barriers to cure research. So first of all, sterilising and functional cure in 2013. And I'd like to start here just to remind you that we have more and more examples of sterilising and functional cure, and every one of them um, is critical for us to identify new ways to approach cure. <coughs> We all know about the Berlin patient and the first example of sterilising cure. And as you all know, Timothy Brown was um, CCR5 positive wild type. He had uh, leukaemia and AML, received a um, chemotherapy and total body irradiation, a stem cell transplant on two occasions from a donor that was Delta 32 homozygous negative and um, had some element of graft versus host disease, a common response following um, stem cell transplantation, and is now CCR5 negative off antiretroviral therapy and no viral <coughs> rebound. And an exciting case and inspiration for all of us, but uh, what, we don't really, what we don't really know is what cured um, Timothy Brown. Was it the donor being Delta 32 negative? Was it transplantation itself? Was it graft versus host disease? Was it the, pre, the conditioning um, regimen that he had? And also whether he had <coughs> indeed a sterilising cure, as many of you know, um, work led by Steve Deeks and Steve Uckel showing that there were tr perhaps very small traces of HIV still detected um, in uh, Timothy Brown. So still lots of questions to answer about why Timothy was cured and I think still a really important area of research. We now have the Boston patients, and this is telling us a little bit about what role transplantation or allogeneic stem cell transplantation, taking marrow from an unrelated donor, <coughs> might play in cure. So these were two patients. They were CCR5 positive heterozygous, and we don't know. That may be an important part of the picture, meaning that they had one wild type and one mutant allele. Not sure if that's relevant. They had HIV and lymphoma and received, I will work this out, received reduced intensity radiation, so some marrow preconditioning, but not as intense as what Timothy received, and a transplantation from a CCR5 positive <coughs> wild type donor, al again allogeneic, unrelated donor. And these patients are both HIV DNA <coughs> negative and HIV RNA negative, now two to four years following transplantation. They still stay on ART, so we don't yet know these are indeed cases of true cure. But they have undetectable DNA, which is very unusual in patients with HIV, and it raises the possibility that it was the allogeneic bone marrow transplantation itself and or an element of grass versus host disease that may be important in eliminating residual reservoirs. And I think over the next few years we're going to hear um, more and more cases of, these, um, of this occurring. Allogeneic bone marrow transplantation is not unusual in HIV. We have really good antiretroviral regimens allowing people to stay on ARVs throughout the transplantation procedure, which may also be key to identifying these new cases. And I believe plans um, from Tim uh, Henrik and Dan Karitsis that these patients may go undergo a treatment interruption to prove if there is a cure or not. Sharon, do you know yep. how severe the graft versus host disease was? Because Timothy obviously had very severe GVH. I actually don't know about the severity. I believe that they did have an element of graft versus host disease, which is always goes along with allogeneic um, bone marrow transplant, but I don't know how severe. Steve may know. Um. I've asked that question and I got an answer. I can't remember. My my recollection is that it was not over. It was not too severe. Yeah. But it was part of the it was part of the story, as was all the immune-based therapeutics that they got to pre prevent um, rejection, including serolimus. I think it's an interesting drug that we should talk about at some point. Yeah. Rapamycin. 
four additional cases, I think, coming from the Seattle group around similar sort of um, findings. Um, we actually are looking at a patient in Melbourne at the moment who underwent an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. He's about six months post-transplant, so we don't have data on that yet. And then we've got the Visconti pr patients, or what's now <coughs> referred to as post-treatment controllers. A small group of patients, 14 patients, treated an acute infection um, uh, on therapy for about three years, have stopped therapy for about five years, and no viral rebound. And I think what we're learning about these post-treatment controllers are first that they're rare, second that it usually is it's primarily been described following treatment in acute infection. There is one case following uh, chronic infection. They don't seem to have unique HLA types, so they're not elite controllers. There doesn't seem to be something special about their um, immune response. It may be where the reservoir is sitting and how central memory cells are infected or eliminated, and Guido might talk a little bit about that. Really interesting group, and we need to try and identify more of these patients. Yes. Was it all 14 that, that started it and ended up like this? No, the, um, the issue with the Visconti cohort is that there isn't a clear denominator of how many patients were treated and und underwent treatment interruption and then control. There are some groups reporting this. Um, large, large cohorts treated during acute infection and of those a group subset that have stopped treatment and it's probably less than 5%. This but is like less than yeah, I would say even maybe even even rarer. Visconti is just a description of the actual cohort. The denominators un, um, unknown for this, but the, the French group have made some estimates of how common this is, and I would say it's less than five percent, perhaps even lower. Do you know why these fourteen responded this way? Do we understand that? Well, um, the French group, uh, led by Asia Sayez Curion, have looked at a whole lot of immunological and virological features of these patients to try and understand it. First of all, on the immunological side, they um, don't have HLA types that we commonly see in elite controllers. If anything, they're enriched for HLA types that are usually associated with poor outcomes. So they don't look like elite controllers immunologically. And he's done a bit of work in where the virus is sitting, which subsets the virus is sitting in. And it, um, this, this um, article is in press and I guess will come out very soon, shows that perhaps you have preservation of central memory T cells, you have fewer central memory T cells infected. So there, we don't really know why these patients have this phenotype, <coughs> but we need to know. And we need to know more, there must be many more of these patients around the world than these 14 patients described in France. As I mentioned, there are occasional case reports, but um, no one's really got together a cohort as clearly as this group in France. But I think, I think this, this cohort is very controversial. No one's yet been able to confirm and people have looked. And so there's some debate as to whether this is really happening elsewhere. Uh, but to me the data are pretty striking in that these guys are very different from elite controllers. They don't have B57. They don't have strong HIV specific T cell responses. The level of T cell activation is very, very low. It's actually high in elite controllers. Um, and most striking, the, uh, the level of DNA in the four people that they looked at longitudinally is declining in the absence of therapy. And that's never been seen, right? Elite controllers, you have a fair amount of DNA stable over time. People in long-term heart DNA generally stable over time. But in these guys, they've claimed in four people, years after stopping therapy, DNA levels are stable. So they're very different from the elite controller phenotype. And then finally, um we have the Mississippi patient and a case of um, paediatric cure that will be presented by um, Deborah Prasau on Monday at 10 a.m. And I think this is under embargo, but another very interesting case of cure in the paediatric setting. Um, and I think the Mississippi patient and the Visconti patients raise um, the whole, uh, it, it demonstrate how, what an impact very, very early treatment can actually have in the natural history of um, HIV. But Deborah will present this on Monday. So what are some of the um, strategies that are being tested aimed at cure? Um, all of you know that the main barriers that we face are latency, long-lived, lately infected uh, memory T cells, residual viral replication, um, 
debated about what role this plays in HIV persistence, but I think emerging data that certainly a subset of patients do have residual viral replication and that needs to be addressed in all our, our approaches to cure, and then of course anatomical reservoirs. So what about eliminating latently infected cells? I think all of you know the rationale for this, that latent infection is characterised by persistent DNA in a resting T cell and limited or no RNA. If we can activate that um, virus, not necessarily activating the cell, but activate the virus, we'll get production of, of RNA. Just I want to explain this because this is sort of helps explain some of the studies. So that a latently infected virus that starts to make new virus, you can detect by finding RNA in the cell or cell associated RNA and we may or may not detect HIV proteins depending on, on how far um, the viral life cycle proceeds and we may or may not detect HIV virions. And if this goes to plan then um, a, vir a, a cell that's producing virus will lead to cell death, either via the virions themselves leaving the cell or by inducing an immune response. And this last point is really key to these activating strategies working. And we have a whole range of different compounds that activate latent virus, at least in vitro. Um, HJAC inhibitors that all of you have heard about, methylation inhibitors, histone methyltransferase inhibitors, cytokines, some antibiotics, um, one group called quinolones, described by Bob Silicano, does sulfur, and they all work um, in vitro. And the first um, cab off the rank to show an effect in vivo was, of course, David Margolis' study, where he gave a single dose of irinostat to eight patients and measured cell-associated RNA, so RNA sitting inside a resting T cell, before and after virinostat. And in these eight patients, and he selected the eight patients before enrolment that they had an ex vivo response to virinostat, or that their cells indeed started making RNA after seeing virinostat, he saw a significant increase in cell-associated RNA. So this was um, exciting data published in Nature last year, showing that virinostat did activate HIV transcription in vivo after a single dose. So we've been doing a um, similar um, study in Melbourne where we have uh, patients who have been on antiretroviral therapy, undetectable viral load, CD4 count greater than 500, who've received 14 days of virinostat. And we've um, followed these patients out um, to three months after enrolment. They also had rectal biopsies prior to virinostat and after 14 days. <coughs> And there was no pre-selection. We didn't select patients based on whether they had an ex vivo response to um, virinostat prior to enrolment. The primary endpoint was again cell-associated HIV RNA, but we looked in total CD4 T cells, not resting CD4 T cells in blood. It made the, 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 the clinical trial a lot easier because we didn't, do didn't have to do leukapheresis and rectal tissue. And um, the trial has finished. Um, we know that it, it was rel virinostat 400 milligrams a day for 14 days is relatively well tolerated. There were grade one and two adverse events. These were pretty common. Um, the m most common ones being nausea, diarrhea, and lethargy, all fully reversible after stopping virinostat. And um, the results. The results are being presented in a late breaker on Monday, and so I won't go through the details here, but we basically found that um, unspliced RNA increased significantly in 90% of patients, so it had a similar effect. And I'll talk a bit more about um, DNA and how long that RNA persisted on Monday. Disulfiram, I think uh, many of you have seen this before. I've st a, a, um, clinical trial performed by Steve, undetectable viral load, patients um, slightly more immunosuppressed, immunosuppressed the CD4 count greater than 200, 14 days of disulfiram. And with disulfiram, um, Steve's group also saw um, some increase in R HIV production. They actually measured RNA in plasma, so virus had actually perhaps got out of a latently infected cell and showed in a subset of patients there was a significant increase of RNA in plasma and it was very quick within hours of administration of disulfiram. 
They looked to see if there was any change in IUPM or infectious virus before and after disulfiram and saw no significant decrease. What's but IUPM is infectious. IUPM is sort of the gold standard for looking at how much infectious virus you have. I think actually our um, view of IUPM is changing. It's, it's, it's using, using one way to activate the cell and we, then we measure how much infectious virus there is and work from Bob Silicano's coming out showing that in fact there's probably more infectious virus than what we get out of an IUPM. But it's, a, it's the gold standard of how, of how much virus is replicating because a lot of the DNA that we measure may be dead virus and may not be replicating virus. Okay, yep. So it's going to be our question then. So this is stimulating non-replicating virus? Yes, so this is, a, IUPM means you take a whole lot of resting T cells and you activate them with um, usually something that activates the T cell receptor. Some infectious virus comes out, you grow that virus in feeder cells and you can measure how much grows out. And I think it's possible that activation through the T cell receptor may not be activating all infectious virus and that's, and um, Bob also will be presenting that data on Monday of, look of, of his estimates that in fact the reservoir might be bigger than what we can measure through IUPM. So if you measure DNA, you measure all the infected cells. Of that about 10% um, about is actually integrated and of that about 10% is infectious. That's usually the sort of rough ratio. So DNA is perhaps an overestimate of how much infected cells are there. IUPM might be an underestimate. So um, the, there are many other trials currently being underway or completed looking at activating agents. I've told you about the Varinostat study finished and will be presented on Monday. Panabinostat is another HDAC inhibitor, far more potent as an HDAC inhibitor and po more potent at activating HIV in vitro. And this is being uh, performed at, uh, in Denmark. The dosing is slightly different because panabinosat has a long half-life. It's just given once, one dose, three times a week. And they're giving it in four cycles, a week on, a week off, a week on, a week off. 16 patients, it's all fully enrolled. And in fact, we're collaborating with this group, looking at unspliced RNA and doing that at the moment um, in Melbourne in collaboration with Lars Ostergaard. And then there's Romidepsin, which is um, a intravenous uh, HDAC inhibitor, also um, a a very potent HDAC inhibitor, more potent than Varinostat, very potent in vitro. Most of that work's being done by Gilead, but looks potent in inducing virus production. And ACTG are um, planning, or <coughs> a study may already be underway with single dose Romidepsin. None of these trials people are stopping. No one's stopping heart. So that I think a key thing of all the activating studies is you have to be on ART on, on at the time of activation, otherwise the whole purpose is defeated. But ultimately, there will be to determine if you've had an impact on infectious virus. You'll need a treatment interruption. Actually, in the um, Danish study, they've in the protocol, there's an optional treatment interruption based on they are measuring infectious virus prior to the to the four week cycles of, of panabinostat before and after. And I think if they see encouraging results, their ethics committee has agreed to an optional treatment interruption. But we haven't done that in Varinostat. Actually, uh, from the data we've seen, I wouldn't be recommending that. Is there not something slightly dodgy about the ethics about that, about kind of waking up a virus and then taking people off treatment? You know, yeah, yeah, well, first. Does that seem a bit dangerous? No, first of all, no, absolutely no, no, makes no sense to stop ART when you wake up the virus. So the whole rationale for this working is that you can't have ongoing rounds of replication. But if you've waken up the virus, there's no new infections because the person's on treatment, and there's evidence that the latently infected cell dies or the number of infectious virus reduces over time, mm -hmm and that the reservoir is reduced to a small size, then that's the point in time at what you might consider a treatment interruption. So it's certainly not the time of activation. It's after you've shown evidence that you may have affected the amount of infectious virus. Um, Christine Katlama, uh, in, a, in a collaboration called Air Immune, has been looking at three doses of IL-7. IL-7, it's a little controversial what IL-7 does. 
There's some evidence that IL-7 is also a latency activator, but IL-7 also can cause proliferation of infected cells. But they've given three doses of IL-7 together with intensification, so all their patients received Miravirock and Roltegravir in addition to IL-7. And um, that study is fully enrolled and they're presenting it as a poster in CROI. And then um, disulfiram, you've, um, we've seen the initial work presented by Steve um, last year, where um, together with AMFAR, looking at a three-day dose escalation study of disulfiram, um, the PI in Australia is Julian Elliott being done with UCSF. Um, this is a really good example of some of the regulatory issues in um, getting cure studies out. <laughs> Steve might want to talk about this. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it at the end, but great idea, um, meaning that we think more people metabolise disulfiram very differently. And in Steve's first study, there was some evidence that if you had higher levels of disulfiram metabolites, you were, the, you were more likely to be having some activation of latent virus. So the rationale here is we're just a very short course and increase the dose above the current licensed dose of 500 milligrams a day. But that has caused us um, an incredible uh, bureaucratic headache and nightmare, which we're, so we're slowly getting through. And I think we will get this study done, but um, we have the funding and uh, we're just going through the painful process of um, getting it approved. And then finally, um, anti-PD-1, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment. So one of the key issues, and we've uh, I've brought this up already, is if we activate latent HIV, this only makes sense if the virus actually dies. And a lot of people are saying um, that this isn't going to happen <laughs> and that we're going to need something more than just activating the virus. And, and some of that comes from we're going to need something else that will kill the cell. And a lot of that is coming from some in vitro work that Bob Silicano did, all in vitro, showing that if you activate a lately infected cell in vitro with the HA inhibitor varinostat, the cell doesn't die. And you actually need to add in effective um, HIV specific T cells to eliminate that cell. We don't yet know if that works um, in vivo. But I think there's a whole lot of issues as we're getting more of these studies coming out. There's a whole lot of issues that we need to think about with latency activators. First of all, how much activation um, do we want or do we need to have an effect? Do we want to be seeing um, viremia and evidence of, of plasma virus increasing or is increase in cell associated RNA enough? How much activation is safe? We um, obviously don't want to be, when we first did the Varinostat, we we're planning our Varinostat study, a lot of people were nervous about activating immune, you know, making immune activation worse, which actually we haven't seen. But, you know, how much activation will be safe even in patients on antiretroviral therapy? Should we use combination activation in vitro? If you do use combined um, activators, you, in, with some combinations, you get synergistic activity. I think we're a way off that because we need to see the safety and efficacy of single agents first. Ongoing replication could be, in, if there is ongoing replication, and even if it's in a subset of patients, we need to identify who those patients are before we give them any latency activators. Um, this is er an area we need to sort out um, with this strategy because it's not going to work if you have ongoing rounds of replication. And what can we use um, if we're really going to need um, a kill approach as well? So most people are thinking of killing in the context of latency activating activators by enhancing HIV specific immunity. And there are several ways that we could do that. And um, the first uh, approach, which I think looks very attractive, is using anti PD1 or anti PDL1 because these agents could potentially have a double hit because they could activate latency and they can also boost HIV specific T cell immunity. So I'm just going to explain that briefly. So Latently infected T cells um, express PD-1. We know that from Nicola Chamon's work that um, you're more likely to find virus in PD-1 positive cells. And PD-1, PD-1 actually binds to another molecule called PD-L1. And basically, when PD-1 binds to PD-L1, it basically turns the cell off or basically shuts down the activity of that cell. 
So it suppresses, it's a way of sort of keeping the immune system under control. It's like the brakes of the um, immune system stopping widespread T cell activation. So we now have um, antibodies that can block that interaction. They can either bind to PD-1 itself, so anti-PD-1 antibodies, or antibodies that can bind to pd one anti-PD-01. And Nicola and Rafiq have shown if you block that interaction, virus comes out of a latently infected cell. So anti-PD-1 and perhaps anti-PD-L1, though that hasn't really been demonstrated yet, are also latency activators. And these compounds have the other advantage that they definitely boost HIV-specific immunity. Lots of really nice work, largely in monkey models, showing that and that there have been recent clinical trials of both anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-01, the antibodies made by BMS, B both BMS and Merck are making these antibodies, but these antibodies have been in clinical trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so we know what the safety profile is like. And so there are two trials, um, there's the anti-PD-1 antibody for Merck that will be given as a single intravenous dose escalation study to H3 positive patients, CD4 counts greater than 350, led by Hiroyu, Hitano and Steve Deeks, um, done through ACTG. And, um, and, uh, and a anti pd one from BMS at, I, at the ACTG, and I gather that's approved. The other approach is to use a therapeutic vaccine, and that sounds easy, but all of you know that therapeutic vaccines have been really, really difficult to develop, <laughs> um, even before anyone was speaking about latency activation. So um, I, I think there's a huge amount of work when we talk about shock and kill, activate, and then use a vaccine. Well, which vaccine are we going to use is going to be a real challenge. But I just want to give you one example of a vaccine that looks quite um, promising and that was, uh, it's a vaccine produced by Argos and it's a dendritic cell based vaccine that uses patient derived virus. And in this clinical trial, they took patients on ART, gave them the vaccine and then had a treatment interruption. And this just shows the change in viral load for each of the patients after they had a treatment interruption. And it was quite promising, meaning that um, there were many patients that had a reduction in the set point of viral load, um, and in those that responded, a, a reduction in viral load by about a log. So this looked pretty good in a th as a therapeutic vaccine without any latency activation, just taking someone on ART, give them the vaccine, and stop, um, stop drug. But this has been a really difficult area in the vaccine world um, to develop an effective therapeutic vaccine. So it's going to be quite tough getting one and knowing which one we should choose if we combine it with an activator. Yeah, Jules. What's the mechanism of action for this? Um, I assume it, 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 was a de I, it was a dendritic cell vaccine, so I assume it boosts T cell immunity, so HIV specific T cells, whether it was CD4 or CD8, I don't know those details. What are the characteristics of these patients? I don't know much more other than they were on ART at the time. I'm pretty sure they were all patients treated during um, chronic infection. Yeah, I mean, Steve, these, these might guys, know. They're generally long-term treated people who had, somehow, the, in order to get to the study, you had to have access to the pre-treatment viral load. So people had to be either off therapy, going off therapy, or to be some stored samples with the virus because they, the key thing here is that they actually exposed the virus in the test tube patients expose the cells to the patients on the virus and that's hard to do. So that was a challenge. Yeah. Generally there were long-term treated people when the infusions were ready. I think there were injections. Yeah, and it was and they were they were chronically treated. They weren't during the uh, chronic yeah. exactly. And and so one of the I think that one of the two people on the right, they didn't rebound actually in the absence of therapy. So they had virus before and viral loads that were detectable before. And after interrupting therapy, the virus did not rebound. They looked like elite controllers. So I actually put them in the basket of other potential cures. Post-treatment control. Uh, do you know the duration of the uh, at which follow this up? was? Yeah, I think this is quick. Yes, I don't know. I don't know how long to follow. It looks uh, it looks a really interesting uh, vaccine strategy. And uh, you know there there are many out there. Um, and it's I still think that next leap to try and combine vaccine with activation is going to be a tough one. 
eliminating virus replication. So I think many of you know that um, most treatment intensification studies have, in fact, all treatment intensifications, most treatment intensification studies have shown no effect on residual virus. So if you look at this HIV DNA, and if you look at low-level RNA or single-copy assay, when you add T20 or lapinavir at adazanavir, raltegravir, 10 trials of raltegravir or moravirot, 4 trials of moravirot, you actually don't see any change in RNA or DNA. So adding more antiretrovirals is not going to get rid of virus persistence. But what some of these trials are telling us is that, that what, but what, this what this doesn't tell us is whether there's virus replication or not, because that's a key question. And I think four of the ten raltegravir studies are actually showing us that in some patients you do have residual viral replication. Now that's not going to mean that adding raltegravir cures you, but it means that you're going to need raltegravir or something else if you're going to activate latency. So out of the ten patients, four, and it all, it's all related to how the study is designed, um, about in, in, in a subset of patients, you actually do have evidence of viral replication, and that's proven by finding an increase in two LTR circles, which is a byproduct of um, blocking integration. And not all studies have found this because they haven't looked early enough. And um, the first study to report it was um, from Javier um, Picardo in um, Barcelona, and then um, Hiroyo Hatanu, together with Steve Dix, have got a, 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 a presentation at Croy with similar findings. <coughs> um, another study by Steve Uckel showed that if you add in raltegravir, you actually get a reduction in HIV RNA in the ileum. And finally, um, third study from um, Santiago Moreno in, um, in Madrid showing that you get a reduction in infectious virus after adding in raltegravir. So there are these four studies that um, have evidence that some patients have residual viral replication. It may not be all patients, perhaps around a third. And I think um, this paper is a really interesting one showing raltegravir concentration in gut. It's just come out in AIDS and um, it looked at raltegravir concentrations in plasma down here and in, um, in, in, in gastrointestinal tissue up here. And the concentration of raltegravir is about a thousand times higher in tissue compared to plasma. And um, there are some other antiretrovirals that also have very good penetration into tissue, but um, this may be one reason why adding in raltegravir makes a difference. And we're hearing conflicting stories about <coughs> penetration of ARVs into tissue, but um, this paper demonstrates that you have massive levels of raltegravir in um, gastrointestinal tissue. Um, and then the favorite, f famous slide that there is this relationship between how much virus persists on treatment and immune activation. So in this study from Steve and Haroyu, they looked at cell-associated HIV RNA. So it was these were cells that were producing <laughs> RNA. Could be in resting cells, could be in activated cells. You, you, they wouldn't have been able to tell, distinguish that in doing these assays. And a correlation with markers of T cell activation here, CD30, CD38 and HLADR, but they also looked at another marker, PD1, and showed this positive correlation. And the correlation might mean that any RNA being produced in pe people on treatment is leading to immune activation, or that immune activation from other causes is driving RNA production. So we don't know what's driving each other, but we know that when, we, when, when, we, when patients were put on raltegravir, which presumably reduced RNA, there was a reduction in T cell activation in Javier's study. Sure. I mean, is it possible also that it's self reinforcing, so you've got both things happening at the same time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you're setting up a, um, a vicious cycle. So interfering with one may block the other, and vice versa. So it would be a good thing either way, yeah. I think. Um, so that means if we're really going to think about what's fueling this persistence, we need to think perhaps of more than just adding additional antiretrovirals, and that's the rationale for a number of studies, many of which the primary aim is to look at reducing immune activation, but also asking whether these reducing immune activation will affect the reservoir, DNA or RNA. Um, using ways to enhance tissue or cell delivery and now we know that raltegravir has got this excellent tissue penetration but there's other ways to do that 
nanoparticle delivery or um, the prodrug of tenofovir that has excellent intracellular, um, which is GS7340, has e excellent intracellular penetration. And then the whole issue of whether we need to look at specifically targeting other cells like the, the myeloid lineage, um, unknown at the moment. Um, finally, making cells resistant to HIV or approaches with gene therapy. There's a whole way, lot of ways that you can use gene therapy um, to eliminate HIV. You can block actually the, the HIV itself using RNA interference and that's being done in a small study done by John Zaire. Um, you can um, express a, a cellular factor that acts as an antiviral <coughs> such as um, apovec 3 g you can actually use gene therapy to try and eliminate integrated HIV. That's been done in vitro by Keith Jerome. Or you can use it to remove an essential host protein, CCR5, which is what most of you are familiar with, using these zinc finger nucleases, which effectively chop out the gene of interest. CCR5 or Keith's used that same approach to eliminate the LTR. I like that. What's that? I like that. <laughs> You're a visual person, yeah. <laughs> you want to see that DNA, <laughs> get rid of it. Um, and uh, so I think all of you are familiar with the uh, Sanganimo studies where patients um, have CD4 T cells isolated, ex vivo modification of CCR5 by these gene scissors, expanding the CCR5 disrupted cells and putting them back into um, people, such as Matt. And there are a whole range of these studies um, being done now with modification ex vivo of T cells, but there's also plans to do the same thing but modifying, st modifying um, stem cells instead of, uh, instead of T cells. And that's um, in process, not yet started. So quickly, current, some of the current barriers. Um, well, I still think the science is a big barrier, not a barrier, but there's still lots and lots of questions and we've talked about many of them before. Um, how you measure virus persistence, is it IUPM or DNA or RNA and what's really going to show that we've affected the reservoirs, what the drivers of persistence are, how to eliminate these really infrequent cells, which is a sort of um, a way of thinking that the oncologists have had for many years and we need to learn more from them and um, the role of the immune system, um, risk benefits, a big, big issue because we're not going to even look at things that are, I think, that are really risky given um, that patients do well on ARVs. Um, regulatory processes, um, we've had a taste of that recently with this disulfiram study, um, the issues about doing it in two countries, um, the issues of um, the rules um, from the FDA, the process going through NIH and, um, and uh, really t just to give a drug that's been around for 40, 50 years has been given to patients at high doses but yet a lot of um, red tape to get this going. It's really important but the process is, is really difficult. There has to be an easier way to do this, especially with drugs that we know have already been given at these doses. And there's a real dip diversity of approach in different countries, which could actually be an opportunity, not, um, not a barrier, because the US has a whole range of um, regulatory processes that are very different to Australia and Europe, and we should see that perhaps as an opportunity. Um, multinational studies are really going to be important, and, um, but often not easy because of these um, differences. Um, patient engagement has I don't want you to give the wrong impression, it's not a barrier. The, my experience with Varinostat in Australia has been that patients were really um, engaged and we had tremendous support from the community. But I am worried about sort of future fatigue because we're at a point of great hope at the moment that this could work and then as we get more studies that show some effect, no effect, minor effects, will we still have that level of engagement and that's I really think important to think about now as the clinical trials are coming out. And um, involvement of low-income countries, I think is really important. We haven't um, done that at all as yet. Why, why do you say low-income countries? I think that just many countries where there's a very large burden of disease, also very interested in right. cure. I didn't have my question completely formulated. Oh, sorry. I was, I was going to say, why not look at differences by race as well? Yes.
of course. Uh, in, in countries where we already have the infrastructure to look yeah. for those differences. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, um, host factors, race, exactly. Um, viral factors might be important. All of this work's largely done in patients with subtype B, and we don't know anything about other subtypes, which are far more common. Not really a barrier, it's just an issue that I think we need to think about. So, um, multiple examples of cure, and I think this gives ongoing hope that finding a cure might be achievable, plus it raises a lot of um, uh, important questions. Activating latency is possible in vitro and in vivo, but unclear if this alone will eliminate cell latently infected cells. Some evidence of residual virus replication in some patients, and this is important for activation strategies. Gene therapy, um, promising, um, but safety and access will be a significant issue. And I, I identified some of um, the barriers. Just want to acknowledge um, all the people that I collaborate with and funders, particularly, particularly DARE, AMFA, Merck, and the Australian government. And just to remind you, actually, Rosanna, I haven't got all the slides, but just to remind you about the um, IS um, Cure Symposium that will be held at in Kuala Lumpur in June. Um, and uh, 29th and 30th of June, and IS are continuing to still do um, a range of activities through their cure strategy. Um, there's an, uh, eth a group focused on ethics, a group focused on social research, industry engagement, and cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness. And these are all um, active groups, with the, all with community representation, tackling some of those issues. Thank you.